Welcome everyone, I'm Kenny Warrior Brick. Thanks for joining me for the video. Today, I hope you got your listening ears on because I'm breaking down how to choose the best phosphorus binder for you. If you caught my last video on phosphorus, then this equation might be familiar to you. Well, today, we're tackling another piece. How much binder to take. But first, let me show you something. The point of the channel in my videos is to help you understand various topics. I cannot, nor anyone who isn't your doctor, give you advice on what will actually work for you. I have no access to you or anything about you. Instead, take what you learn and discuss it with your doctor to better help both of you come out with a better plan for your health. All right, now that we got that out of the way, let me start by asking a question. How many phosphate pills or binders do you need to take to cover or stop the phosphorus that is in your meal? The answer to this might surprise you. The potency of a binder or how well a binder can work can be calculated by two expressions. The phosphate binder equivalent dose or PBED, which is the amount of phosphorus bound or absorbed by calcium carbonate, that's Tums, at one gram, 1,000 milligrams. The second expression is relative phosphorus binding coefficient, or RPBC, which is the amount of phosphate bound in a new binder compared to that of calcium carbonate. But why is the standard calcium carbonate? Well, that goes back to when binders were first discovered and used. See, aluminum was the first binder used, but it was soon to discover it had toxic effects. Later, in the mid to early 80s, calcium carbonate was used. And the tests were pretty positive compared to aluminum. They found that calcium didn't absorb as much as aluminum, but it also didn't have the same toxic effect. Since most binders are element-based, the easiest and most common way to classify binders is calcium-based and non-calcium-based. And when it comes to calcium, there really is only two options, which is calcium carbonate and calcium acetate. Other options do exist, such as calcium citrate, but studies show that these forms of calcium are ineffective, if even effective at all. And if you recall from my phosphorus video, calcium and phosphorus have an inverse relationship. So basically when we're comparing or when researchers are comparing these two, basically what they're doing is seeing how much calcium can actually bind phosphorus to lower the phosphorus. And in case you didn't know, binders don't just have these elements such as calcium within them. They also contain other things such as fillers or components that actually help the elements bind to the phosphate in the food. For instance, calcium carbonate is only 40% calcium. That means in a 500 milligram tab of Tums, only 200 milligrams of that is phosphate binder. The rest is fillers or other components that it actually needs to work. And the same is true for calcium acetate, but only 25% of calcium acetate is actually calcium. And even though calcium carbonate contains more calcium than acetate, studies show that these two binders actually bind about the same amount, if not a little bit more acetate binds more phosphorus in some studies. So what that means is that the extra calcium in carbonate actually is absorbed by your body. So you will have a higher calcium amount in your body. So what this means to doctors and patients is that if you're having a hard time controlling your phosphorus, but your calcium is still in a stable level, then calcium acetate or phoslo might be the best option for you because it'll absorb that phosphorus and not a lot of calcium will get into your blood. But if you're having a hard time controlling your phosphorus and your calcium may be too low, then Tums may be the best option for you or calcium carbonate because this allows that phosphorus to be bound, but will also help raise that calcium level. Linking this back to our terms, that would mean that calcium carbonate, Tums, and calcium acetate, Phoslo, at 1,000 milligrams or 1 gram would have the same relative phosphorus binding coefficient, or RPBC, which would be 1. So how exactly do we put a value on this to rank them? Since a phosphorus binding equivalent dose, or PBED, is a standard on 1 gram of calcium carbonate, a 500 milligram tum would have a 0.5 value, meaning it has half the efficiency of absorbing because it was compared to 1,000 milligrams. 500 milligrams is obviously gonna be half of 1,000 milligrams. 
thus half effective. So comparing calcium carbonate to calcium acetate, both of these have basically the same function and would thus have a value of one. But what if calcium and phosphorus are both too high and hard for you to control? Well, let's take a look at some of the other binders or non-calcium based binders. Sevlamir or Renagel would be our first binder to look at, which has a RPBC of 0.6 or 60% of that compared to calcium carbonate. But studies do show that it has another interesting downside, which would be an inverse relationship to dosage. Meaning that the higher the dose you take, the less effective the pill actually is at binding phosphorus. So less and less phosphorus is actually bound. In fact, studies show that up to a 35% reduction in efficiency can actually be found. So the higher you take, the less it is. So if you're a person who eats a lot of phosphorus, this definitely isn't a good choice for you as a binder, especially if you keep trying to take more and more pills, which is only gonna keep lowering how much phosphorus it's actually binding. Another mineral we can look at is lanthanum. Lanthanum is sold as phosrenol, and this binder has a RPBC value between 1.2 and 2.0. And the reason for this it was depending on how researchers were actually using the binder in their, in their studies, either by element or by weight, meaning milligrams, how many milligrams somebody was given, or by the element. The next elemental binder we have is magnesium. And most studies show that it has an RPBC of about 1.7. And if you recall, in the beginning of this video, I mentioned how aluminum was once used as a binder. Now, I don't recommend anybody to go take it on their own due to the toxic effects. And it's really only considered to be used when phosphate is extremely high and still only for a brief period. Still, I think it's important to put it on the list to compare it to the other binders we have. And aluminum has an RPBC of 1.9. The next two binders we can look at are based on the element iron which are oxyhydroxide and citrate, both of which have different binding capacities, which the oxyhydroxide has that of 1.6 and the citrate 2.0. Okay, wow, that was a lot of information, but the best way to use it might be to rank them. I mean, we have their values and that's the point of this video. So, were you keeping notes? It's okay, I got it. But these numbers just help you determine which binder binds the most phosphorus over the other. You're still missing another piece of that puzzle. But one big part of the topic is what I covered in the phosphorus video, and that is how much phosphate you're actually getting in your meal. One study found that HD patients on an unrestricted diet consumed about 2000 milligrams of phosphorus. So let's take that information and build something like a clinical case. Keeping in mind factors that impact phosphorus from my phosphate video, such as vitamins, minerals, types of phosphate, and using the 2000 milligram diet intake I just discussed, we could guesstimate that Miss S would absorb about 1500 to 1200 milligrams of phosphorus in a day. Since the average person will also have three meals and one snack a day, we will divide the math into those. So we have a low range and a higher range of the amount of phosphorus that is actually had. Now that we have some phosphorus numbers, let's break this down down using the ranking system. And also recall that PBED is based on calcium carbonate, which binds 45 milligrams of phosphorus for every gram or 1000 milligrams, since all our other binders will be based on this standard. I will have to fix this in edit because at regular speed, this explanation may take 15 to 20 minutes. So if you get lost, slow the video down and even rewind it if you need to. But the way this works is we take the amount of phosphorus in a meal and divide by how much the binder actually binds. Product, or what it equals, is how many binders you actually need to take. There is one thing we forgot to talk about, and that is how much actually needs to be bound in a meal. Phosphorus is essential, so you don't want to lower it too much. And for this video, I'm suggesting binding 50 to 70% of the phosphorus, which would change our numbers like this. With Sevlamir, things get a little tricky. Recall that this binder is less effective the more you take, so the RPBC is 75 to 50% as a range. But that lower, less effective range of 50% starts when we get a dosage of 
at least four PBED, 4,000 milligrams of calcium carbonate, which unfortunately will be both meals. But the snacks barely skate by, so we can use the upper range of 75% for that, meaning you will take less pills for the snacks, unfortunately more pills for the meals. And one last thing guys, look at the binding ability of these iron binders. They're so much powerful. I mean, how much better would it be just to have to take one or two pills? Man, that sounds so fantastic. But hey, maybe you consume less phosphate than our imaginary friend here. Although another study on patients trying to follow a low phosphorus diet who were on dialysis found that patients consumed about 245 milligrams for breakfast, about 25 milligrams for lunch, and about 445 milligrams for dinner. Which not only supports the idea that you do need different amounts of binders depending on how much phosphate is in your meal, but also you could be underestimating how much phosphate you actually need to cover. And just on a personal note, if you look at this right quick, 245 for breakfast, 445 for lunch, for 245 for breakfast, 445 for dinner. Okay, that seems like they're having a decent breakfast and dinner. But look at the lunch, 25 milligrams of phosphorus. They seem like they're starving themselves. Trying to reach that 800 milligrams to 1,000 milligrams of phosphorus a day limit. And I don't know about you, but personally, I need three good meals and at least one, if not more, snacks throughout the day. So I want to make sure I have the right binder covering that. All right, I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up for today. But y'all let me know in the comments how y'all dealing with y'all binders. Was any of this surprising or useful information to you? And why don't y'all do me a favor and hit the subscribe button and help support my channel. Y'all not new here. Y'all know how it works. All right, till next time, warriors.